ZipRecruiter has come on board as a proud sponsor of Without Warning Podcast. Use code WOW and search for jobs anytime, anywhere. Please support the sponsors who support Without Warning Podcast, the voice for the voiceless. The Lauren Agee case was hastily closed by authorities, but many questions remain. Come behind the curtain with private investigator Sheila Waisaki as she uncovers the truth about what happened to Lauren. This is Without Warning. Warning. The following episode contains details about sexual violence and elements that are graphic in nature. On the last episode, you got to hear from Judge Jonathan Young of DeKalb County, Smithville, Tennessee, his ruling, and particularly what he thought of me. That episode generated the second most phone calls I've received on feedback. I can safely say that the listeners understood the contempt that was coming through from Judge Jonathan Young towards me. The hard episodes are over. Listening to Jeremy Taylor, Sheriff Patrick Ray, Judge Jonathan Young. After this episode, I'm going to focus on the investigative process and what I did with my team and how I do it. There will be a break for CrimeCon, which is in New Orleans. I am doing a workshop June 6 on one of my new cases. I am calling it Murder Mystery in Meridian, Mississippi. I interviewed Tom Shaw for this episode because I wanted a layperson to understand what happened in the court and with the judge. I work with a lot of attorneys, and I know good attorneys, and I know exceptional attorneys. Tom Shaw is an exceptional attorney. He fights for the victim's families like I've never seen it before. He spends hours finding that one law that can help us. On another episode, I'll tell the story about how Tom Shaw and I met. I call those stories God nods. I could tell you story after story about how great Tom Shaw is as an attorney and a person, but instead I'm going to let him speak for himself and you all decide. On this episode, Tom Shaw and I will talk about the judge and the Court of Appeal rulings. Tom brings it to the layperson's level of understanding. Tom is going to explain what happened in the original judge's court and the Court of Appeals. Tom is a Southern gentleman, so he doesn't criticize others well. You're not going to hear him say anything probably ugly about anybody. Hi, I'm Tom Shaw. I am a trial lawyer in Dallas, Texas. I took the bar in uh, March 1985 and passed it in May, and I've been practicing continuously since. The AG case is uh, an interesting case, and the Court of Appeals opinion is uh, important, not only for um, Sherry Smith and her family, but for uh, lawyers in Tennessee. The issues involved there are several fold. One is the summary judgment practice in state court was elaborated on by the Court of Appeals and the issue of expert testimony and expert affidavits in connection with what's called summary judgment practice. And the final issue is is the effect of a litigant in a civil action taking the, the fifth and what effect that has on the burden of proof and what needs to be shown in a civil case where, in this case, the defendant took the Fifth Amendment. And it's interesting because often in civil cases, we'll have an overlap of criminal uh, activity with civil activity. And in this case, you have the four defendants 
who were friends of Lauren Agee's. Now, some of the other interesting issues in this lawsuit are uh, attached to what's called the complaint. The complaint is the uh, document that's filed in court that initiates the lawsuit, and the complaint describes the activities or actions by the defendants that resulted in the cause of action arising. In this case, the cause of action being the uh, wrongful death of Lauren Agee and then the subsequent cover-up of the activities of the defendants in participating in the killing of Lauren Agee or the cover-up of that killing. One of the interesting aspects of this is whether or not the plaintiff has alleged that this is a conspiracy to harm Lauren Agee. If they do allege a conspiracy to harm Lauren Agee, then everything every conspirator does and says in connection with attempted cover-up or any further uh, activities is usable or admissible against the other members of the conspiracy. The important thing that that I saw was when you were, when Sheila Wysocki, you were interviewing uh, one of the participants, apparently that uh, defendant got a phone call and there was a discussion in front of you on keeping their stories straight. That in and of itself could be evidence of a conspiracy and if it is evidence of a conspiracy, then the plaintiff's lawyer can tie everything together, no matter who said it, it's admissible against the other defendants. And that's very important in a situation like this, because the difficulty that the plaintiff has in this case is four people know what happened, and the fifth that knows what happened is dead. The only people that know what happened are the four defendants. Oftentimes, defendants will split. There will be a, a truth teller in the bunch. In order to work around the Fifth Amendment, several things have to happen in my mind in, the, in this particular case. Number one, you've got to figure out what does the Fifth Amendment apply to. And in this case, there are as I indicated earlier, there's some discovery, which is questions to the other side that are attached to the complaint. And they're called interrogatories. And the interrogatories ask specific questions and uh, they expect answers. In this case, Hannah Palmer refused to answer those interrogatories, claiming that they potentially cause her to say something that might incriminate her. The other interesting aspects of the Fifth Amendment and this discovery is the phone records. The phone records should be discoverable. In order to determine whether or not the Fifth Amendment applies to a discovery request that asks for documents, you've got to determine whether or not the discovery request asks person who's answering the discovery, use her mind and make decisions on what documents should be produced and what shouldn't be produced. In this case, asking for her phone records for the day that she disappeared, uh, and I believe that's July 26th of 2015, asking for the phone records for the 25th and the 26th, probably the 27th, 28th, and 29th of July, uh, these are documents that should be uh, discoverable because it doesn't take any thought process to put into determining whether or not these documents should be produced. It's phone records, they're produced. The other way to get around that, if you're the plaintiff's lawyer, is ask the deponent, who is your telephone provider? If it's AT&T, then subpoena AT&T. You get the phone records for that time period, and you determine who's making phone calls to whom, and uh, the, the timing on those phone calls is important. Uh, obviously, people want to know who 
uh, Hannah Palmer and Aaron Lilly and Chris Stout and, and Mr. Gambrill were calling the morning and afternoon of July 26. Are they communicating with one another? Are they texting with one another? Now, the issue of texting is important because once a communication is sent out to someone else, it can't implicate the Fifth Amendment. It's already out there. It's not if Mr. Stout st sends a text to Hannah Palmer, that's not protected by the Fifth Amendment. If that exists, if that text exists, it can be discoverable. Any texts that any of these defendants sent to anyone is discoverable. That's waived. As to them, they've shared that with someone else. They've shared their thoughts with someone else, and therefore, that should be uh, discoverable. Email communications, all email communications between and among uh, Lily, Gambrill, Palmer, and Stout are discoverable. There's no Fifth Amendment right to not producing the email communications between those defendants, certainly during that time period. Now, obviously, email communications between their lawyers is not discoverable. Now, a way to get around. Let me ask a question about that. If you enter into a joint joint defense, doesn't that kind of send a message, though, that something's up? Sure, it does. But uh, as far as a jury trial would be concerned, that would not be admissible, more likely than not. It's highly prejudicial and really doesn't advance the ball for a determination of whether or not these folks uh, did what uh, the plaintiff accuses them of. Now, remember that the, I want the, uh, the listeners to remember that in this civil case, the burden on the plaintiff is much different than the burden is on the state. In this particular case, the plaintiff has to prove that what she claims happened more likely than not happened. It's not beyond a reasonable doubt. And when I'm trying to what we call voir dire, which is question a jury panel before we picked the jury and in selecting uh, members of the jury, it's very important in this case that the plaintiff's lawyer educates the jury and makes the jury understand that the burden is not on him to do the work of the state and prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Now that segues into the issue of what happens when a civil litigant pleads the Fifth Amendment. And in this case, the defendant Hannah Palmer pled the Fifth Amendment to most substantive questions. Now, normally, in civil cases, unlike criminal cases, in the event there is some evidence of what is the subject matter of the question to the defendant on which the defendant took the fifth, then the jury is instructed that with respect to that question, the jury may assume the adverse against the defendant. In other words, I've had a case involving the killing of a, of a young man, and I took the deposition of the person that we thought killed the young man, and we asked questions. And as a predicate to the questions, I wanted to make sure that there's some evidence of what I'm asking the defendant in that case about. For example, did you go down the hall with the intent of covering up the fact that you killed Mr. X? Uh, in this case, the woman did go down the hall, but she waited a period of time to go down the hall. If that evidence 
is heard by the jury, then the presumption can be raised that her taking the Fifth Amendment is a tacit admission that what the subject matter of the question promotes. And in this case, the question was, did she go down the hall and did she go down the hall with the intent that it delay the finding, in this case, of the, of the, the young man's body? Court of Appeals determined that it wasn't handled the way it should have been handled, set forth the rules that I just uh, stated, which are uh, the generally the rules in Texas as to the use of the Fifth Amendment in civil actions. Now, it, it's important for the listeners to understand the that in, in criminal cases, that's completely different. The jury does not get to hear that the defendant took the Fifth. In fact, during voir dire, and I'm not sure... Uh, Forgive me, I don't practice in Tennessee, so I don't know what they call the questioning of the jury in Tennessee. But during that period of time when the lawyers question the potential jurors or the Ironman, they're asked to uh, understand that in the criminal law, uh, a person has the right not to testify. And the fact that the person has not chosen or has chosen not to testify cannot be used against that defendant. And I've seen I've been sitting on panels where people are asked that question. And sometimes people have some difficulty with that because logically we think that an innocent person doesn't have anything to hide. And interestingly, in the AG case, the plaintiff's lawyer brought that up in his argument uh, at the summary judgment hearing. And that's that's logical. That's intuitive that we think that someone who doesn't have anything to hide should want to talk. That's not always the case because we receive instructions from our attorney that says, you don't want to say anything sometimes uh, prosecutors uh, in their efforts and their zeal to uh, get to the bottom of something will misconstrue something that someone says. So rather than have that happen, oftentimes lawyers will instruct their client, do not speak to law enforcement until you had an opportunity to talk to me. And that's true whether you're stopped for a DWI or any other action and inter interaction with law enforcement where law enforcement is looking to potentially charge the person they're interviewing with a crime. You're always at risk that law enforcement, which is generally recording the conversation or videotaping it, that you might say something that could incriminate you. And the way to avoid that is simply tell them that I choose to invoke my right against self-incrimination, and I'd like to speak to a lawyer. It sounds like in this case, as I think we started out with this particular issue, that the defendants in this case, the civil defendants, uh, spoke openly to the police. And I wonder if that's going to come back and haunt them in the end. All of them, but Bricks did not speak to the police at all. He refused to meet with them, and they didn't push it. What was open was that the police officer was dictating to him what happened. It really wasn't an interview. Can you tell the audience what a summary judgment is and why it's important? Yes. Now, in this case, a summary judgment uh, is used to uh, dismiss the plaintiff's case before the plaintiff can get before a jury. And what the summary judgment does is the moving party asks the court to dismiss the non-moving parties, either their, their complaint or their defense a specific affirmative defense. In this case, 
uh, Hannah Palmer's lawyers. And I think the uh, some of the other lawyers may also have moved for summary judgment. I, I got that impression from the judge in indicating that the only summary judgment that was before him at the time was Hannah Palmer's motion for summary judgment. And what the uh, movement does is they say there are no genuine issues of material fact as to the plaintiff's claims and that they should be dismissed as a matter of law. That means that all of the f pertinent and material facts cannot be disputed. And the way they, the, in this case, the way the defendant accomplished that was by using the plaintiff's own uh, pleadings against her. Uh, normally what you do if you're a moving party is you have a an affidavit or deposition testimony or some admissible evidence that suggests fact A, which is a material fact, then the burden then shifts to the non-moving party to, to dispute fact A and to say, oh, no, 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 no. For example, the light was red, according to the deposition of John Doe. The non-movement would then come back and say, well, you know, uh, Tom Shaw said that the light was green. So that's a, a specific dispute of a fact, and summary judgment would not be permitted on that issue, and the issue must go to the jury to decide. In this case, there were no affidavits by the Palmer folks and the non-movement uh, submitted a number of affidavits that the court then analyzed. And the Court of Appeals was very critical of the trial court in the manner in which it analyzed each of the affidavits, because ultimately the, tr the trial court determined after striking certain portions of those affidavits that the non-moving party didn't meet whatever burden it had in order to avoid summary judgment. Now, the interesting aspect of the, the summary judgment ruling in that Tennessee, in the, uh, the Smith case, is that summary judgment jurisprudence in Tennessee changed January 2015 to uh, make it, uh, to change the standard uh, on which the moving party would have to obtain summary judgment. Tennessee Supreme Court summary judgment standard in Tennessee was similar to the summary judgment standard in the federal courts, and that prior to the change of the law, it was too easy to avoid summary judgments. That um, too many cases were getting to the jury that shouldn't have gotten to the jury. The bottom line is they wanted to make summary judgment a little bit easier. A little bit easier, a little bit harder. A little bit easier. The defense bar wanted the courts to apply a more rigorous standard to the plaintiff's evidence at an earlier stage in the process to make sure that bad cases don't get through. Now, this particular case is tricky, and there's five people that know about what happened, probably. Uh, one of them's dead, and the other four ain't speaking. So there's got to be a way for the plaintiff to um, unravel this and prove her case. And the way that she, the only way she's going to be able to do that is by linking the circumstantial evidence. In this case, the circumstantial evidence is somewhat replete and exists in the uh, record as it exists now. For example, the statement to the private investigator, Ms. Waisaki, you keep your story straight. That's a pretty damning statement. Something that I didn't see that was raised, but Hannah Palmer's flight from Tennessee, 
there's a presumption in criminal and, and uh, civil law that when someone flees the scene of the crime, there's a presumption that they're fleeing from something. And in this case, I would argue, I think there needs to be some more discovery on the timing of her flight from Tennessee. But from a plaintiff's perspective, it seems to me that that has some weight. Not calling the family immediately is suggestive of either shame or fear that Hannah Palmer, uh, I believe Hannah Palmer was was um, her, one of her best friends. If Hannah Palmer was a fair weather friend. So whenever it was convenient for Hannah to be Lauren's friend, she was. Whenever she was between boyfriends or you know, it, 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 she was not a best friend. She was a neighbor down the street from her, though. They grew up together. She was on and off. But the bottom line is, in this case, Mrs. Smith would have expected a phone call from uh, Hannah. Now, that... You wouldn't... Wait, 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 listen, as a, just as a dad, wouldn't you expect it from someone who is with your child? Yes, I would. I would. I travel a lot. I am in and out of airports, in and out of the hot weather. And when I get home, the last thing I want to do is cook. And I'm not that great of a cook anyway. So I love to have an option when I walk through the door. I just want to eat something nutritional. That's what I love about Daily Harvest. Daily Harvest delivers thoroughly sourced, chef-created food that is built on fruits and vegetables and can be prepared in less than five minutes. When I got home from presenting PI Experience, I walked in the door with my luggage, opened the freezer, pulled out mint and cacao smoothie, added almond milk, put it in the blender. Five minutes, I was drinking a delicious smoothie. Go to dailyharvest.com and enter promo code WOW to get three free cups to your first box. That's promo code WOW for three free Daily Harvest cups at dailyharvest.com, dailyharvest.com. Now, another piece of circumstantial evidence is the potential bite mark on uh, Lauren Agee's body. Um, that and the, the link there is trying to get the dental records of Hannah Palmer in order to see if that uh, bite mark was a bite mark by uh, Ms. Palmer. That would be damning in my mind because that would suggest that something happened that resulted in Hannah Palmer biting Lauren Agee. I expect that Ms. Smith knows her, her daughter's body to a certain extent and would be able to testify that before she left, she didn't have any bite marks on her. And we have pictures showing her in a bathing suit beforehand. And you can look at those, uh, blow those uh, uh, those photographs up and determine whether or not there was a, a bite mark. The marks on the neck looking like strangulation, um, those are damning. Somebody did that. Now, I'm unclear in the answer by the defendant uh, Palmer, there's a suggestion that there's a necessary party that needed to be brought in, and that was uh, Lauren Agee's former boyfriend. Now, there's my question there is the timing of the crime and where Ms. Agee was during this entire time period is such that I don't know that she could have left the top of that hill from the time that she returned after her night of partying and she's found in the water uh, face down in a place that she probably wouldn't have been by accident. Lou, murder detective, caught which was the trauma to her body was not the type of trauma that the trauma that would, would have resulted from her falling down the hill 
wasn't on her body. I don't know that the judge was right in that case by saying that the detective couldn't make that determination because I would think that that's something that uh, former detective Liker would have been able to come to a conclusion on. There were certain criticisms of some of the expert witnesses that seemed aggressive by the judge, and given a longer look, perhaps he might not come to the same conclusions that he came at that time. I think that the expertise of Detective Liker in his 40 or so years with, um, I believe it's LAPD, I think he mistakenly called him a former FBI agent. I, I don't think Detective Liker is, is former FBI, but regardless, um, the type of crimes that detect, former Detective Liker would have participated in would have given him the background necessary to formulate a number of those opinions. And that, that comes to the issue of the expert, which is an expert is a person who has knowledge that could help the jury come to its conclusion. The expert is offers information on something that the jury may not have knowledge of in their normal course of, of life. For example, a detect, a former Detective Liker was an expert on criminal investigations. That umbrella covers a number of different specialties. Sometimes detectives like former Detective Liker will rely on the information provided to them by other folks. For example, a criminologist. And the detective may see something in the forensic pathologist report that the uh, forensic pathologist who say has only been doing this five years may not see. So saying, as the judge did, that simply because uh, Dr. G didn't see something and either the uh, personal private investigator or Detective Liker saw it, that doesn't make them less of an expert than than otherwise suggested, uh, Liker being someone that difficult to go the other way and, and not find a genuine issue of material fact with respect to what Liker spoke about. Now, the danger in, well, there's, there's several things about the Liker affidavit in this case that were interesting to me, because the one thing that the judge indicated, and I was surprised when he backed off this this statement, was he suggested that Liker was one of the most experienced law enforcement people that he'd ever had in his court, and he apologized to the law enforcement people that were sitting out in the uh, in the crowd. So, and then he goes and criticizes former Detective Liker for coming to certain conclusions. I think that the judge might rethink that in when the time comes to consider the summary judgment. But the other thing that perhaps the plaintiff's lawyer might want to consider here is having a more extensive affidavit from Liker and being much more careful about his qualifications and the things upon which he relied. That the plaintiff's lawyer was really at a it was really hamstrung in this case in my mind the case was filed on july 22nd 2016 the summary judgment was filed in september of 2016 less than two less than a month and a half after the lawsuit was filed a summary judgment motion is filed that's extraordinary i have never seen that before that's shocking, particularly in Tennessee, where you have the equivalent of a federal motion to dismiss, which is essentially what uh, Palmer's lawyer was doing, is asking the court to dismiss the plaintiff's claim based upon the pleadings themselves as not stating a cause of action. 
it's almost the equivalent in my practice in Texas of a no evidence motion. But I see no direction by Tennessee courts to allow that type of summary judgment motion to proceed. Now, your listeners may include lawyers from Tennessee, and I'd be delighted to find out from them if there is a vehicle in Tennessee jurisprudence that would allow a defendant or a plaintiff to file a no evidence motion within a month of filing a lawsuit. That doesn't happen in Texas. There, as a matter of fact, in our jurisprudence, you have to certify to the court that enough time has passed for discovery to have occurred and allow a no evidence motion to proceed. A month and a half is is not that. So what would have happened in Texas? Would the judge have thrown that out and said, not not right now? Or what would have happened? It, more likely than not, a judge would have would have declined to hear it. What I would have filed if I were the plaintiff's lawyer in that case, if it were pending in Texas, is I would have filed a motion for continuance and described the type of discovery I needed to do. And one of the things I might have considered doing is taking the depositions of the experts so that the experts could describe in detail what their findings are and you can coordinate those. The other thing that I found very unusual that the court did here, um, that perhaps the Tennessee jurisprudence is different, but the presumption is generally in courts that the lawyer assists in the preparation of affidavits. The judge here was critical of the affidavits of certain of the witnesses being identical to one another and criticizing less uh, credentialed affiant saying that they just copied the uh, opinion of the more credentialed person. I thought that was unusual because as a an attorney, I might criticize an affiant if they didn't follow form of another affiant and criticize them. Well, I guess you didn't agree with what this witness said. You said it a little bit different. And there there is a strategic reason for doing that. And perhaps this court is very aware of the fact that attorneys do participate in the execution, uh, the preparation and, and uh, generation of affidavits. But I think that that's a bit of picking nits by the court. But he did get the opinion turned around. He was given some a roadmap to follow in the future. If I'm the plaintiff's lawyer, I consider following a conspiracy, commit a battery as the main method to get to where he needs to get. And then a conspiracy to cause uh, Ms. Smith emotional distress by keeping information from that, from Ms. Smith and or misconstruing it or lying about it. I don't know what the parameters are of intentional infliction of emotional distress, but I can't imagine that those aren't met if four people get together and decide to lie about how this woman's flesh and blood uh, died in this this very sad and tragic manner. I, I was suggesting some of the circumstantial evidence. The other evidence that's circumstantial but suggestive that the death occurred in a manner other than uh, accidental fall is the marks on the body not consistent with falling. Uh, And that was, as I said earlier, that was raised by uh, former Detective Liker. The no fluid in the lungs, that's suggestive that that she didn't die of drowning. If she died of drowning, I believe the the forensic evidence would have been that she had fluid in her lungs. So the circumstantial that what that results in is that 
if she didn't die from drowning and she didn't die as a result of falling down the cliff, then the only thing that could have happened is she had a heart attack up on the uh, up on the bluff and fell. She's already dead when she fell or something happened to her up there. And the only people that were up there, as I understand it, were those four kids. And those are the only people that had any interaction. So the presumption then is that one of those or all of them participated in the activities that resulted in Lauren Agee's death. Okay, so I have some questions for you, and some of my listeners do too. And I've been writing, it looks like I'm distracted. I'm writing things down as you're saying them because I want to go back to them. So one of the things that I did, I agree with you, Lou Liker saw 400 murders. He worked 600 murder cases. So this is not your average um, detective. He knows how to do a murder case. I did think it was interesting that the judge said he's the most qualified and then proceeded to throw everything out. I don't understand the the logic to that. It it was nitpicking, but well, the 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 way I would look at this, Sheila, is in re-preparing his affidavit, I would be a little more careful about supporting the broad opinions that he has with specifics. And I I think that will result in a very long affidavit but it will inure to the benefit of the the non-movement in a summary judgment for former detective Liker to really flesh out the opinion. I would suggest that the plaintiffs look at the, in a case that's pending in Texas called uh, Cruz versus the, the Jonathan Cruz case. There's a statement by Daryl Robertson that's a very well thought out statement in a similar situation to the one here. And I would encourage the plaintiffs to, and, and full disclosure, it's an affidavit that, that uh, I participated in uh, looking at before it was went out by Daryl Robertson in a case uh, that I, I am working on myself. I think that former Detective Robertson really did a fine job on the affidavit in describing his qualifications, in describing uh, what his opinion is, the methodology. And that's an important thing that the judge broke down was, what is the methodology that Detective Liker used in coming to his conclusions? And then is that a methodology that's normally accepted in the law enforcement community? And I would, if I were preparing the affidavits in this case, I would go through what's called the Daubert standards and prove up every single opinion saying that the methodology I used is the methodology that's standard in law enforcement and that that methodology has been approved by police academies and all other law enforcement training institutes, including Quantico and other law enforcement training facilities. Depositions were not done but prior to this summary judgment. Personally, think that should have been done. The case you and I've worked on, depositions were done pretty quick, and that helped formulate what happened that night. And we were able to investigate based off of the testimony people gave. In this case, they did not do depositions. In a normal case, do you do depositions right away? That's a strategic decision that's made on a case-by-case basis. Some cases justify a great number of depositions. Other cases don't. Uh, particularly where the amount in controversy is is insignificant versus a case where the amount in controversy is significant, where the facts are in dispute. Those are factors that you've got to take into account in determining when and if you take depositions. Now, when I'm the plaintiff, I like to be able to take the defendant's deposition earlier rather than later because I want to commit 
the defendant to a story. And I want to know what that story is so I can test it with later depositions. Now, the downside to that is you don't always know the facts right away. So you may miss something that you wish you would have gotten at a later time. And in this case, because you have four individuals, you're probably only going to get one shot. Now, you can get a second shot if you can show the court that something came up later that you couldn't have anticipated. Because more likely than not, when I go before the judge and say, well, I took, um, for example, Ms. Palmer's deposition within six months, and then later we find out that she was lying, for example, and she moved to Florida instead of moving to Florida 12 months after this happened, she moved there uh, 15 days after that happened. That may justify going back and taking her deposition again or asking her questions that I couldn't have anticipated at the time I asked her the first time. Now, I can't think of, as we sit here today, I can't think of questions that, that could come up in that circumstance, but I'm sure your, your listeners can think of some knowing the facts of this case is, I think they probably know them. They could probably think of things that if the plaintiff's lawyer would have taken Ms. Palmer's deposition and she would have been forthright and not taken the fifth. And then, you know, 12 months later, they find out a set of additional facts that, oh gosh, I wish I would have asked Ms. Palmer those questions when I had her the first time. But the, to answer your question in a concise manner, the decision on taking depositions is, is definitely a case-by-case -case basis. But in this case, I think it would have certainly behooved the plaintiffs to have been able to take some depositions before they were forced to file a response to the motion for summary judgment, and it may have never gone up to the Court of Appeals. I don't know. As I said, both sets of lawyers seemed to know what they were doing. It was well presented, but perhaps in 2020 hindsight, and we all have 2020 hindsight in my profession, it would have been better to have asked the judge if this was available to continue uh, discovery to take place. So in this case, Sherry Smith in that courtroom has never won. It's, it's Sheila. It's hard to it's hard to make a call on the whether or not they should win every. Or, or do you know that for a fact? Oh, I'm in the court. Oh, you're in the court. No, the judge hates me, uh, Tom. It's really kind of funny. <laughs> I gathered that. I gathered that. He tried to suppress his 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 feelings, but they came through on uh, your affidavit. He thinks he thinks falsely. Here's the way I listening to this, his decision and reading the the transcript. He thinks that you prey on the emotions of troubled people and make a bunch of money. That is false. That is so false that he doesn't understand that you're not making money on this. I have had personal communications and I've worked with you and you don't make money on this and you don't do it for the money as far as I'm concerned and you do it because it's the right thing to do. Because these people are looking to someone to help them. And my experience with you is that I had enough confidence in you when I knew you pretty well to tell John and Pam Cruz that they didn't need me. They needed you. I think to me, that's probably the the, the most complimentary thing that a lawyer can say about a contractor with whom he or she is dealing is you don't need me. You need her. It's, it's kind of like, you know, you don't need, uh, you know, the police, you need Batman. <laughs> and uh, that's, that's the way I viewed you is you put your heart and soul into a case. Once you've got your, your heart and soul into it, it's going to tear your heart out not to, to solve the crime.
Well, as you heard, he disagrees with you. <laughs> so. Well, but but he doesn't understand the relationships that you have with your clients at all. The thing that really bothered me was how he described what you normally do, which he has no clue. You don't go eavesdropping on husbands that have lovers somewhere. I thought that was an, a, a bit of a stretch for him to guess that that's what you do for a living. It, it'd be better if he Googled your name or looked at what you do on YouTube. You know what? It's okay. I think he's getting a real good view now of what I do. I, I think he's figured out that you're a tough opponent. I hope so. Because you know what? I'll do my job. I know. I know. I know. I would expect someone who takes an oath to do their job too, as you do. I mean, your job, you take an oath to do your job to the best of your ability for your clients. That's right. I expect him to do the same. I expect the police to do the same. If they did, if we all did, then, you know, we wouldn't be in court. Yeah. Thank you for that, by the way. This opinion is very important to the state of Tennessee and to the, to the lawyers in the state because of, of three things. Number one, the summary judgment standard in the state of Tennessee has been fleshed out by this court and how you move for summary judgment in certain circumstances. Number two, the analysis given by the Court of Appeals to the trial court's decision to utilize uh, motion to strike or motion in limine in carving up the affidavits that were submitted by the plaintiff. And then the analysis, probably the most important part of the opinion from the perspective of, of litigants and lawyers in the state of Tennessee is the analysis of how to use the Fifth Amendment uh, assertion in a summary judgment standpoint or uh, ultimately, when you go to trial in Tennessee, a very helpful opinion to Tennessee practitioners. Hopefully, it will kickstart the uh, Lauren Agee case and allow the judge to view this in a, a manner consistent with what the Court of Appeals told him through their opinion. I started this podcast for the listeners to understand the process of what happens behind the scenes in an investigation. It's not pretty or entertaining. It's messy and ugly, and it's contentious, and it's hard to listen to at times. The interviews are not perfect and produced, and the content doesn't always come out the way you want it to. But I put out exactly what people were saying. I wanted you, the listeners, to hear directly from the source. I have accomplished that. Now you know what happens behind the scenes. I've had several people say how hard it was to listen to, how angry they are. And I've had people say that they're not entertained. This isn't an entertaining podcast. This is a podcast to produce a resolution. From this podcast, I have gotten tips. I've gotten leads. I know what happened. I've gotten help from other podcasters. This is the greatest single tool for an investigation that I will be using in all of my cases. Thank you for the listeners who have stuck it out through the entire process. The Lauren AG case is coming to an end, and I will be sharing another case from another family in another terrible situation. I look forward to having you all give me feedback and helping me as much as you have in the Lauren AG case. The last thank you I want to give is to the listeners who have bought the sponsor's items. Without you all listening and buying the sponsor's items, I wouldn't be able to produce this podcast. So thank you. 
I also want to thank the listeners for sending me pictures when they get their items. Very cool. Lauren's family gives their full permission for any and all details to be shared in hope that the truth will come out. If you know anything at all, call 1-888-599-0008 or email tips at sheilawysaki.com.